There we go. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. The word Advent means coming because in this holy season, we prepare for the coming of Christ, both his first coming as a baby born in Bethlehem and his second coming at the end of time. To help us prepare for Christ's coming, we light the candles on the Advent wreath. Each candle reminds us of hope, peace, love, and joy that Christ brings to the world. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope. We light it again to remind us that the Christ child born in Bethlehem will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and establish his kingdom forever. Today, today we light the candle of peace. The prophet Isaiah called the Messiah the Prince of Peace, and Jesus taught people to be peacemakers and said that they shall be called the children of God. Christ brings the peace that passes all understanding and will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the peace you give us in Christ. Help us to worship you, to listen to your word, and to do your will by being peacemakers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this Crossroads worship and music team. I thank God for families and those of you in the life of this congregation leading us in this Advent candle lighting. I love Advent and Christmas. Amen. We are in the second Sunday in this holy season of Advent. And our worship and sermon series is basically a journey to Christmas. And so I'm grateful for the stories we have heard and will hear as part of this special worship and sermon series. It is based on passages selected by a sanctified art. A sanctified art is a group of women who are pastors and artists, creatives, and they have designed much of the liturgy, the words that we are using here in this service and also at our 10.30 a.m. worship service. And you have experienced some of their work in the devotional guide that we provided this year in this holy season of Advent. Today's theme and the title of today's sermon is God Meets Us in Our Fear. God meets us in our fear. And it's based on Luke 1, verses 28 to 38. So let us listen now to the word of the Lord. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin engaged to a man descended from David. The man's name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Gabriel came to Mary and said, 
Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. But the angel assured her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How is this possible since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will rest on you. So your child will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And your cousin Elizabeth will also give birth to a son in her old age. Everyone called her barren, but she is six months pregnant, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite the children to leave us also. And as they leave us, they have an opportunity to learn with members of our staff and volunteers the truth and power of God's word, especially at this most holy time of the year. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you are here by the power of your Holy Spirit. This is such a time of joy and peace. Be with us. I pray that we hear these words, not as my words, but as your word to us this day by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's passage is called the Annunciation because Gabriel's, it is Gabriel's announcement to Mary that she will bear the Christ child, that she will bear the promised Messiah to Israel and the Son of God. The Annunciation is a common subject in Christian art, and you'll see an example here on the screen. This artwork that you are seeing is titled Annunciation. It is by Fra Angelico, the Renaissance master painter, and it was painted in 1434. I like it. It captures the holiness, the majesty, the glory of that moment of the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary. It has this ethereal quality to it, doesn't it? At the same time, it doesn't capture the human. To me, it doesn't capture that raw emotion, the feelings that Mary must have been experiencing in that moment, especially when Gabriel first appears to her. After all, Mary at that time was only 12 or 13 years old the age when most Jewish girls would have been engaged as she was engaged to Joseph. And the passage says she was greatly troubled. That's a good translation of the Greek because the Greek here is emphatic. It is a deep emotional angst that Mary is experiencing when she first sees the angel Gabriel. I think of it as a mix of what the heck is this about? And awe. And then, yes, fear. I like the translation of this Greek verb in Eugene Peterson's message translation of the Bible. It reads, Mary was thoroughly shaken. <laughs> she was thoroughly shaken. In fact, in the Old Testament, 
when people meet an angel or a divine being or an agent of God face to face, that is the emotion that they experience. That is their most common reaction, a reaction of fear. Zechariah, for example, in the story right before this one, the angel Gabriel appears to him, remember, to let them know that, uh, that his own wife will give birth to John the Baptist. And his reaction reads in, the, in that passage that Zechariah was overwhelmed with fear. And that same Greek verb translated overwhelmed with fear in the passage right before this one is a cognate of the verb translated greatly troubled uh, about Mary in today's passage. And then when you think about the Old Testament, not every angel was seen as benevolent. Think about the story of Balaam and his donkey. If it had not been for the donkey, Balaam possibly would have been killed. He didn't see this angel wielding a sword that would have killed him were it not for Balaam's donkey that prevented that. So, I like this poem by Primo Levi. Primo Levi was an Italian poet. He died in the late 80s. And he captures Mary's fear in his poem titled Annunciation. It reads in part, Don't be dismayed, Mary, by my fierce form. I come from far away in headlong flight. Whirlwinds may have ruffled my feathers. I am an angel, yes, and not a bird of prey. An angel, but not the one in your paintings. So, Mary needed to hear the angel Gabriel say to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Do not fear. And so do we. We need to hear those same words. Because fear is one of the most basic human emotions. In fact, in psychology, as some of you know, when they name the most fundamental six or eight human emotions, fear is one of those. It's innate and universal. It's hardwired into us as a species to fear, especially fear our enemies. And it's evolved, obviously. So it's evolved in us as a species. So there is always something to fear, right? That's who we are. We have that built into us. Some to help us survive. Doesn't mean we should fear. Doesn't mean we will fear. But we know it's there. It's in us. What about you? What is your biggest fear? Or what are some of the fears that keep you awake at night? In a recent survey of parents in the United States, about a third of them said that they were extremely worried about the possibility of a shooting at their children's school. An additional 40% said that they were somewhat worried about a possible shooting at their children's school. So seven of 10 parents in the United States in a recent survey have this fear. Maybe for some of you here, it's one of your <laughs> biggest fears for your own grandchildren or children or for students. I've heard students say it is their biggest fear. Of course, the death of a child is a parent's worst nightmare. And I know some of you in this congregation have lost a child. You know how horrific that loss is in your own lives. And in some moments of my life, that fear, the fear of the loss of a child, rears its ugly head in my own life. One of my biggest fears, though, is the fear of death and dying. It's not something I think about much, but it's, it's there. I sometimes have that fear, too especially dying. Not so much death, but dying. Henry Nouwen was a Roman Catholic priest, just a gifted Christian writer, and he's been a mentor to me and so many others. And in one of his books, he talks about our fear of death and dying. He writes, there's much death avoidance in our culture. When someone dies, for example, we say, he passed away 
or she left us, not he or she died. We deny death, he adds, and we hide it from view. And he's talking about how in earlier generations, the family would many times prepare the body after the person had died, but we don't do that. It's whisked right to the funeral home. It's hidden from the sight of children. We don't want them to see that. And then now in writes, it's not just death that unsettles us, of course. It's the process of dying too. Can you get an amen? The slow deterioration of body and mind, the pain of a spreading cancer, the prospect of burdening friends and family, an inability to control our movements, a tendency to forget recent events or the names of family, the suspicion that loved ones tell us only half the truth to protect us. All of this, he says, understandably frightens us. And then he ends, no wonder we sometimes say things like, I hope it won't take long. I hope I die of an unexpected heart attack and not of a prolonged disease. I know I've said that myself. Yes, death and dying is one of my biggest fears at times. In the dark of night, that's sometimes when it will hit me. And my bet is that every one of us at some time in our lives has had that as one of our biggest fears. You'll be glad to know I'm not going to end on this heavy note. There is good news. Very good news. And the good news is that God meets us in our fear. God meets us in the fears we have in our lives and gives us the courage to face those fears, even the biggest fears that we have. God does this for Mary. I imagine the angel Gabriel seeing the dread on Mary's face. He's just said, greetings or rejoice, but then he sees the dread on her face. And he doesn't say, fear not, Mary. No, with gentleness and compassion, I imagine him saying, Mary, you have nothing to fear. Do not be afraid. God has your favor at his heart. He is with you. Then he explains to her how this will occur. And he answers her very good question, how the heck is this possible? He answers her question. And in the end, she then has courage. The courage to be able to say, yes, here I am the servant of the Lord, may it be to me as you have said. And I don't imagine at that point, and we shouldn't imagine at that point, that Mary is some fearless superheroine. No, she probably still had fears in her heart. I think, for example, she might have been thinking, what will Joseph think? What will my parents think about this? What will people here in Nazareth think about this if they learn about this? But she believes at that point that God is on her side. She believes that God will provide, believes that God is with her, that God is at work literally in her to be able to fulfill what God says he will do. As one scholar I read wrote, Mary is promised God's powerful presence for this call. And we can see her courage in the very next story as what does she do? She heads right to her cousin Elizabeth's house and celebrates this good news of what has occurred in her life. She is able to express that courage that she has been given by the power of the Lord, and sing her Magnificat, sing that song that we celebrate at this time of year. How about you? How has God met you in the fears that you have in your own life? And how has God also given you the courage to face those fears in your own life? God met me in my own fear, has met me in my own fear of death and especially dying. As I said, it sometimes wakes me more in the middle of the night. 
And thankfully, the last several times that's occurred, I've been able to remember the promises of God in the Bible. I think, for example, of Paul's words, nothing in life or in death will ever separate me from the love of God in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Yes, the resurrection, but even more than that, I think of Paul in Philippians where he says, if it's your will, God, I would be here on this earth and serve you, and yet I know it's better to be with you in your nearer presence. And so I remember that. There's something more that we're able to see here. There's something more on the other side in that eternal life, and that obviously gives me comfort and hope. And then I think of words offered by people like Frederick Buechner. <clears throat> he died back in, in August, and I've appreciated his writing as a Christian, as a Presbyterian. And so I want to read one of, uh, an excerpt from one of his books and how that has helped me also in those dark nights. It's a little book where he defines words that matter to us as Christians. And one of the words that he defines is dying, not death but dying. And he likens dying to flying. And when he does that, he says it's like we are in a crowded, noisy, and frenetic airport. He said, imagine the babies crying and all the frenetic energy you can think of. And it's also on a day when it's snowing and sleeting. It would be dangerous to fly. And then he writes these words about dying and that definition in his book. The runways show signs of icing. Flight delays and cancellations are called out. When you finally board the plane, you peer through the windows for ice on the wings and search the faces of the flight attendants for anything like the knot of anxiety that you feel in your own stomach as they run through the customary emergency procedures. The great craft then lumbers its way to take off position the engines shrill. As the plane picks up speed, you count the seconds till you feel liftoff. Once airborne, you can hardly see the wings at all through the gray turbulence scudding by. The steep climb is as rough as a Ford pickup. Gradually, it starts to even out. The clouds thin a little. Here and there, you see tatters of clear air among them. The pilot levels off slightly. Nobody is talking. The calm and quiet of it are almost palpable. Suddenly, in a rush of light, you break out of the weather. Beneath you, the clouds are a furrowed pasture. Above, no sky in creation was ever bluer. And then Beekner ends by writing, Possibly your last takeoff of all is something like that. When the time finally comes... When the time finally comes, you are scared stiff, to be sure. But maybe by then, you were just glad. Maybe by then, you were just glad to leave the whole show behind and to get going. In a matter of moments, everything that seemed to matter stops mattering. The slow climb is all there is the stillness, the clouds, then the miracle of flight. As from fathom upon fathom below, you surface suddenly into open sky, the dazzling sun. How about you? How has God met you in your own fear, fears that you have? And how has God given you the courage to face those fears? Think about that this week, I pray. Give some time to pray about that. And remember, as you do, Mary's faith and trust, her example in today's passage and also believe, believe Gabriel's promise that nothing is impossible with God. Alleluia.
Amen. Good morning. We have the courage to pray for ourselves and for other people because of Christ's invitation to us. He said, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. And with this assurance in our hearts, please join me now in prayer. God of wonder, God of might, your whole creation shimmers with beauty. We praise you and thank you for the wonders of your creation, for sunshine and birdsong during the day, and the bright winter constellations floating above us at night. For the rhythm of the tides and the seasons, we thank you, Father, for our very lives and the lives of those we love. Creator God, You are the beating heart of our universe. We trust you created the world good and that you have a plan to prosper us. Yet we see evil and injustice around us on such a great scale and feel helpless to stop it. So we pray. We pray for peace in our world, in Ukraine, in Haiti, in the Congo, and in all areas of conflict. We pray for those who have been victims of natural disasters as they recover from storms, earthquakes, fire, or floods. And we pray for the planet you've entrusted to our care, which we have thoughtlessly exploited. We place these prayers for our world in your powerful hands. Christ Jesus, We await your coming with hope and confidence. You came to show us an example of compassion and service, grace and love. We pray your example inspires us to help those who are in pain physically or emotionally, those who are hungry, those who suffer injustice. Help us follow your teachings to show kindness to those who are different from us to forgive those who anger or hurt us, and to look for opportunities to share the good news of our salvation with family and friends. Holy Spirit, we pray you will fill our hearts with love so we can live fearlessly in this broken world, even with joy. We live in the midst of a commercial culture that markets its expectations of what the perfect Christmas should look like, Family and friends place their expectations on us as well. When we become overwhelmed with the busyness of the holiday season and the effort of living up to the world's expectations, we pray your still small voice will gently refocus us on you. Holy Spirit, grant us peace. Now, Lord, as we open our hearts to you, we lift up these specific prayer requests. We pray for healing for Tom, who has pneumonia. We pray for comfort and peace for Leslie, who just lost her husband. Hear also our personal prayers, which we offer aloud or in silence. Guide us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, so we may, like Mary, overcome our fears and confusion by trusting that you are with us always. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our giving, whether it's our time, our talent, our treasure, is an act of worship. And I want to just take a moment to, again, celebrate the fact that the Holy Spirit is indeed, I think, guiding our congregation in a bold new direction for 2023 in our annual pledge campaign Give, Grow, and Glorify God is still underway. Uh, I want to thank, on behalf of our staff and our session, the 326 families who have already pledged for this campaign and, and the support of the church in the coming year. If you've not yet had a chance to do so and God is leading you to do so, today is a great day for you to join in this campaign to continue to follow God's will in the ministries and mission of this church. But today, as we pause to give, again, we are, an, we are worshiping God through what it is we give. Um, you may be able to give here in this service. You may be giving online. You may be giving using the QR code. If you um, especially are worshiping online today, you can take your phone camera, capture that, and it will take you to a, a very simple way to give. You can still send in a check by mail. Whatever way it is that you choose to give, know that it is the faithful outcome of that gratitude toward God, for God who meets us in our fear and leads us forward. So now, let us give with gratitude God's tithes and our offerings.
holy season of Advent. It's our prayer as we do prepare for the coming of the Lord as a babe born in a manger, and one day on the clouds with power and great glory. And one of the best ways that we prepare for the coming of the Lord is by music. Thanks be to God. And you'll see an opportunity this afternoon at 4 p.m. to do that. The International Carol Suites. Mark Hayes is here. He's such a noted composer and musician. We're so grateful to have him here. We heard a little bit on Friday night for those of you who were able to be here. But this has been a, this is a specially commissioned work um, for, that our church did. And so we're grateful to have Mark back and to be able to enjoy this afternoon of music. Invite a friend, neighbor, and join us. And then you'll also see that right back here next Sunday at 9 a.m., this Crossroads worship and music team that we love will be leading us in a time of Christmas music. We'll have some special readings as well, some other voices in the mix here on the stage. So again, invite a friend, a neighbor, and join us next Sunday right here at 9 a.m. for this special music of the season that we will enjoy at 9 a.m. here in Fellowship Hall. And then it's back, our journey to Bethlehem. Some of you will be volunteering to do this, um, but we're so grateful for this live walk through nativity. And it will help you again to prepare for the coming of the Lord by experiencing that journey to Christmas. And then on the last slide here, you will see our Christmas Eve services, that last opportunity to prepare for our Lord's coming. And note especially that the earliest service is at 4.30 p.m. That's usually a lot of families and children in that service, about 45 or 50 minutes, so a little bit shorter. But each of these services will end with candlelight and singing, silent night, holy night. Thanks be to God. Now let us prepare to leave this place to serve the Lord our God by singing our last song, Glory, Let There Be Peace. Please stand and join us. i 
And how has he given you the courage to face it? Do think about that. Pray about that each day this week as you move through this week. And have in your hearts as you do that example of Mary, her faith, and her trust, and those words, the promise of the angel Gabriel that nothing, nothing is impossible with God. And all of God's people said... Amen. And go in peace. <laughs> Thank you.